bless you. Welcome to the sanctuary this morning on this cool fall day. Question, I need you to be loud so that people who are not here can hear your answer to this. If you, had, if you could have a, ye a year of summer or a year of fall, what would you choose? Fall. Oh. I thought you'd say. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think fall might have it here in the in the sanctuary this morning, but we're so happy that you are here. We're happy that those that are joining us by way of radio, or maybe will be watching us on Facebook Live or YouTube later on this afternoon or through the coming week. Glad that you're all here to uh, join us and to participate in uh, in our service this morning. We're excited about a lot of things. One of the things we're really excited about this morning are our new monitors. But let me tell you, I'll bet the choir is more excited than you are. Because the first time ever, we have our own monitor. Uh, so we can now see what's going on uh, without having to look over our shoulders. So another step forward into the, into the century, uh, the, the United <laughs> Methodist Church has moved. But we're happy for uh, we're happy for those uh, for those additions. When you came in this morning, uh, I hope you saw the prayer cards on the table um, in the back. I just happened to look over them, uh, and everything that I've been telling you is on these cards. Things like if you need to keep it confidential, you can mark it there. You can mark all the specifics. Uh, just a great little tool. But if you have prayer concerns. Uh, or praises that you would like to share with the prayer team, if you would submit those to Patty May. Uh, her Gmail is on the, on the screen. She will make sure that the prayer team uh, has those requests, those concerns, and those praises, and they will use those throughout this, throughout this coming week. So a great opportunity uh, for you to lift up anything that's on your heart. Remember, those are on the table as you... Uh, as you came in. Also inserted in your bulletin um, each Sunday morning are the opportunities of the week and the prayer concerns that we have received over the past week, the past couple weeks really. Let me remind you also that there's Pastor Chris and Pastor Willard and Megan in the office. If you have any communications that you would like to uh, be made, Megan will make sure that she gets those to Pastor Chris or Pastor Willard or if you have something that's really super, super important to you and you need to speak to them personally, they are always available to you. Continued thanks for all of the support for uh, the church through your giving and your tithes and your offering. You can use the mail. You can use an auto draft. You can use the Venmo app. You can text the word give lots and lots of ways. Easiest way is the offering plates as you came in this morning. But again, thank you so much. Um, for your support in the, your support of the mission and missions um, of the church, I believe those are all of the announcements that we need to have made this morning. I'm going to ask Eric and our musicians now if they will actually come and lead us in our morning worship. Would everyone please rise?
No need for the cheat sheet anymore. We've got it up there. Would you join me as the body of Christ this morning as we recite together the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Turn and greet your neighbor this morning, extend a handshake, word of welcome, and then you may be seated. How you all doing? Thank you, all right? Yes, sir, real well. How are you doing? How are you? That puts a lot of pressure on Robert and his wife to make sure that, that the words are coming across. But I trust you guys. This morning our scripture comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 34, verses 1 through 8. Would you hear God's word? I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Thank you. 
I hope that you do take this prayer request sheet home and, and use it. Um, you may not know everything that's on there or even everybody, but I'm telling you, the Lord's at work and he does know. I um, just want to reiterate what Jerry said, that if you do have a prayer request, um, just get that in. That's, that's the one thing that gets us through, is that, that daily prayer. Um, and, and let me tell you, there's a team of warriors who have stepped on the battlefield on your behalf. And that intercessory prayer is one of the best tools that, that we as a church can offer. And I am thankful in my life for that. And so um, if you do have a request or, or a praise, um, let us know, because we'd love to play, pray with you and for you. So pray with me, if you will. Father, as we are reminded this morning um, to taste and see, um, and I think if we just get a taste, we'll want the whole thing. And so I pray that that taste happens this morning, that, that we're able to taste of your goodness and your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness, and that will sustain us. Father, I pray for these requests that are, that are here on this page. We know that you're already at work, but we also know that when your children cry out that you listen. And so, Father, this morning we, we lift up these names, but we also lift up um, names that may be not be on here or situations that may not be on here. Um, the things that seem to be at the front of our thoughts or at the, uh, at the front of our minds when we wake up and when we go to bed. Father, we lift up all those unspoken requests. I pray, Father, that that you continue to just do a work inside of us, that, that we are able and, and, and that we are motivated and that we have the opportunity to proclaim your name anywhere we go. I pray, Father, that that happens through our work, that that happens through our conversation, that that happens when we're on social media. No matter where we are, Father, I, I pray that you give us that space to be able to lift you up. Father, I pray these things in your name. And we pray together the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Thank you, friends. Wonderful. Appreciate that very, very much. Pam, you're missing your opportunity. Tommy's already been through one service as well. He's out of here. I want to take a moment before I begin this morning to thank Robin Kerr for leading what, in my mind, is one of the best laity Sunday worship services I've ever been privileged to uh, observe as a pastor. Uh, she did a fantastic job. But one thing I, I was teasing her about in the early service, she's the lay leader and she coordinated every bit of that and you didn't hear one word from her last Sunday. She managed to get through the whole day without saying a word, which was fine with her. But the work that she did in, in recruiting our speakers and encouraging them and, and coordinating with us the worship service was just phenomenal. And so I want to take a moment to thank Robin for that. As we get ready to hear the word of God, let me invite us to bow for a moment of prayer. Come, Holy One, as you have already been present in this hour of worship, continue to be present and speak to our hearts as you've spoken through the time of prayer where we've communed with you as you've spoken through the music of your saints. Speak now through the word that you inspired so long ago and through the servant who proclaims it. May each word that flows from my mouth, heart, and lips be pleasing in your sight and may it enter the ears, minds, and hearts of this, your people, that they may be encouraged and all of us can live out our next step in the journey of faith. So come, Holy One, Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. We read this morning from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter, verses 46 through 52. And, and I invite you to hear this reading from God's Holy Word. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with the large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How did you get your name? How'd you get your name? Some smart aleck in the crowd's going, duh, my mama and my daddy gave it to me. Well, that's true, but I guess what I'm really asking is, why was the name you received chosen for you? People are sometimes named for biblical characters, historical figures. I had a great-grandfather named Grover Cleveland Ison. Actors or sports legend. There's a, a whole generation of 40-something men in Kentucky with the first name Kyle after the legendary basketball player at Kentucky, Kyle Macy. Sometimes, however, the names have unusual origins. The website BuzzFeed invited its readers to, to share the unique origins of their names, and some are downright hilarious. One lady wrote, I'm named Macy because my mom went into labor at a Macy's department store. <laughs> Another wrote, my mom was a huge Disney fan and wanted to name her first girl uh, to have a princess name. My dad, however, hated Disney and refused. So my mom suggested Aurora, and my dad, unaware that this was the name of Sleeping Beauty, said, that's okay. She said he was two and a half years old, she was two and a half years old before he figured it out, and he was not happy. Another lady wrote, my mom named me Mary, after Merry Christmas because I was born in December, and she was high on the epidural, but she flipped it around and named me Christina Marie. Many of us, including me, received our names because they were chosen for us to honor another family member. And the same was true in the time of Jesus. We, we meet one such person on the outskirts of Jericho. His name is Bartimaeus. The gospel writer Mark makes sure that he explains to his non-Jewish readers that the Aramaic practice of naming the son after the father 
takes place by putting the word Bar in front of the name. So Bartimaeus is essentially naming him Timaeus Jr. We know a few things about Bartimaeus. We know life is hard for him. You've heard about those who are born with two strikes against them. Well, Bartimaeus has got three against him. I mean, first of all, he's blind. And in the time of Jesus, it was commonly understood that, that blindness given to a, a child or a person was a sign of God's judgment, that they or their parents had done something wrong. Strike one. He has to beg to survive. Strike two. Even his name works against him. Bartimaeus translates literally as the son of one who is defiled or unclean. Who names their kid that? I mean, for real? Strike three. You're out of there. Well, Bartimaeus has a lot working against him. He is, however, very smart. If he has to beg, at least he knows when and where to do it. It's just before Passover, the time when the Jewish people remembered God's deliverance of them from the slavery they experienced in Egypt. It was and remains a major event in the lives of the Jewish people to this day. It was certainly true for the people of Jericho. Jewish custom required all males aged 12 and over who lived within 15 miles of Jerusalem to go to the temple for the Passover. Jericho, coincidentally enough, happened to be 15 miles from Jerusalem. Mark tells us apparently at the beginning of the story that a group of men are preparing to make the journey from Jericho to Jerusalem. Among those men would have been many priests and Levites. The late New Testament scholar William Barclay notes that the work of the service of the temple is divided up among six groups of 20,000 men. They serve on a rotating basis. And a lot of those, when they were not serving, lived in Jericho. You got a whole big crowd getting ready to leave Jericho to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. It's a big deal. And those, that day in Jericho, those who were not going, the women and the children and the men who were unable to travel, would have gathered along the road to see their loved ones off on their journey. In addition to those who were getting ready to leave Jericho to go to Jerusalem, there would have been people passing through Jericho on their way to Jerusalem. It would have been a great time in a rural society where everybody was so isolated to have all these strangers coming through town. People, hey, where are y'all from? You know, it would have been great. Well, off in the distance, they see a group, and it's a large group, relatively speaking, headed in their direction. It's got not only men, but it's got women in it as well. And as they begin to get closer, you begin to see that it's a pretty sizable group. I could easily envision one of the adults saying to one of the children, go run and find out who that is. Turns out it's Jesus of Nazareth. Barclay noted that the crowd walking with Jesus was very customary in his time. Well-known rabbis would have had their disciples gathered around them, and as they walked, he would have talked and taught them. Jesus' reputation as a miracle-working teacher would have undoubtedly preceded him. So now the folks of Jericho who are getting ready to leave are going to wait till he gets there. And the people who have come out to see them off are going to stay. And here comes the group making their way toward Jerusalem. But one of those sitting on the outskirts of town was Bartimaeus. He hadn't come to make the trip to Jerusalem. He hadn't come to see the pilgrims off. He'd come to beg for help. And just like next week, when the kids know which neighborhoods to go to to get the really good candy for Halloween, Bartimaeus knew exactly where to put himself to receive the most financial help. He knew that as they were leaving town, the pilgrims would be in a good mood and a generous mood as they were going to worship God in Jerusalem. There were Jews who'd be making a once-in-a-lifetime trip passing his way. They were going to feel very generous, and he'd do all right. I told you. It's like they say in real estate. Location, location, location. He's smart. So when the buzz hits... Jesus coming to Jericho, I can imagine that everyone snapped to attention. Oh my goodness, we've heard about him. This is important. Everybody clean this up. Get that garbage up. Don't do anything to embarrass us, goodness sake. We all know that one person who's going to open their mouth and say something that embarrass us. And if you don't know who that is, it's probably you. 
So everybody's putting their best foot forward as the parade comes through town when all of a sudden Bartimaeus starts screaming, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Really? Today of all days, Bartimaeus, shut up. Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. But when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus who was nearby, he was not going to shut up. He was going to do whatever it took to get his attention. Nothing and no one was going to stand in his way. I have some lessons for us here. You see, Sunday after Sunday, we come here to worship. And sometimes life is good. We're doing all right. But there are other times when life's not so good. In fact, it's a dumpster fire. But we're kind of like those people with Bartimaeus. Shut up. Don't say nothing. Don't call attention to yourself. Just, just sit there. You'll get through it. Bartimaeus may have been physically blind, but in many ways he had far more vision than most of those who were present for this time. And that included the disciples of Jesus. You see, Bartimaeus addresses Jesus as son of David. That's a messianic term. This is the first time in the Gospel of Mark someone's called him that. A blind beggar on the outskirts of Jericho sees what others have missed. David McKenna, the former president of Asbury Seminary, wrote, For the first time, Jesus is publicly called the son of David. It's a messianic title. Bartimaeus has recognized Jesus for who he is. For a blind man, he sees quite a bit. And you know, one might have thought that having heard that the miracle worker Jesus is nearby, some of his friends might have said, you know, Bartimaeus, he healed other people. He, maybe he could heal you. Let's go see him and help him up. But instead they said, shut up. With friends like that, you won't need enemies. But he's having none of it, and he screams even louder. And it's then that Jesus stops in his tracks. I can imagine just the whole parade stops all at once. And he sends for Bartimaeus. My twisted sense of humor is such that I get a real kick out of the thought that those who were telling Bartimaeus to shut up have to help him up and help him get to Jesus when Jesus sends for him. Do you serve coffee with that humble pie? <laughs> when he's brought to Jesus, Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? And it is now that the vision of Bartimaeus is fully revealed. Now, not his eyesight, because he's still blind in this moment, but he had a spiritual vision that was greater than that of the disciples of Jesus. Take some time, flip through the pages of Mark one day, and look at it. Mark goes to great lengths to just, quite frankly, make the disciples look kind of stupid. When Jesus explains to them that he has to be crucified and risen on the third day, Peter says, oh, that's never going to happen. Jesus looks at him and says, get thee behind me, Satan, because you're not thinking the way I'm thinking. When Peter, James, and John go up on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah show up and it's an incredibly holy moment, the first thing Peter thinks is, hey, let's build some tents. Huh? When the disciples cannot cast out the unclean spirit in the boy, they fail to recognize the importance of prayer. And Jesus says, this is a kind of spirit that can only come out through much prayer. Perhaps the best example is found in the passage just before the one we read this morning. If you've got your Bible app open or you did something weird and brought a Bible to church, look up a few verses to verse 35, and you're going to see that to which I'm referring. Jesus and the disciples have started their journey to Jerusalem, and James and John have the audacity to come to Jesus as if he's some kind of genie and say, we want you to give us a wish. For real? So Jesus looks at them and says exactly the same thing he says to Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? And they say to him, well, since you're going to Jerusalem, we know that God's going to restore the kingdom of Israel, cast out the Romans. One of us wants to sit on your left and the other sit on the right when you restore the kingdom. You can hear the face slap of Jesus hitting the palm of his head. Unreal. They've traveled with him all this time, and this is the limit of their vision. Well, when the other ten disciples hear this, they go absolutely berserk. 
Jesus has to pull the car over, so to speak, and come back there and straighten them out. And he has to explain to them that the kingdom of God is not about the pursuit of power or prestige, but about a life of service. And now here's Bartimaeus in front of him and Jesus saying, what do you want me to do for you? And I half envision, I don't half envision, I envision Jesus asking that question and slyly looking over his shoulder at the disciples. See if they figure this out this time. And Bartimaeus says, Rabbi, I want to see. Now, my friends who know Greek far better than me, and that doesn't take much, think I make too much of a big deal about this. But for me, it's a very important part of this story because in the Greek language of the New Testament, when Jesus asks Bartimaeus what he wants him to do for him, Bartimaeus responds, Anna blepo. Blepo is to see. Anna is a prefix, which means basically again. Rabbi, I want to see again. It's the same prefix that appears in the Gospel of John when Nicodemus is talking to Jesus and he asks him, what must he do? And Jesus says, you must be ananothen. You must be born again. Apparently, Bartimaeus had once been able to see, but had lost his sight. And he wants Jesus to give it back to him. And that's exactly what happens. Jesus gives or restores the gift of sight to Bartimaeus and maybe, just maybe, in doing so, gives the disciples the gift of insight. Because Mark tells us that Bartimaeus promptly joins the party and goes to Jerusalem with Jesus. And his presence would have been a living reminder every time that the disciples looked at him, they would have remembered that Jesus had asked Bartimaeus the exact same question he had asked James and John just a little before. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and those of us who would follow in his footsteps have to do the same thing. There's a final thought here, though. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus heals a whole lot of people. It starts in the very first chapter with healing Peter's mother-in-law, for which Peter never forgave him. No, I'm uh, kidding. <laughs> Just seeing if you're still with me. The paralyzed man who had been lowered through the hole in the roof in the second chapter, the woman with bleeding issues in chapter 5, the the daughter of Jairus who'd been raised from the dead in chapter 5. He even granted sight to another blind man before Bartimaeus at Bethsaida in chapter 8. All of these miraculous healings. But there's one thing different about this one. We know the name of Bartimaeus. And he's the only one whose name we ever learn. Could it be that Bartimaeus not only followed Jesus to Jerusalem, but but to the cross and to the empty tomb and became a leader in the early church. We can't know that for certain, but we know one thing. We know who he is, and there must have been a reason for that because names matter. Our names matter. Your name matters. See, this morning we gather here, and in this important place, in this important time like Bartimaeus, location, location, location. God is here. His spirit is here. And maybe we're like Bartimaeus, finding ourselves in need of a restoring of our sight. Don't worry about what somebody else thinks. Cry out to Jesus. As if your life depends on him. And don't give up crying out to Jesus. Now maybe we are like the disciples. Find ourselves more worried about prestige and place in God's kingdom. And God needs to do an attitude adjustment on our heart today. He'll do that lovingly. Just as he did for his disciples. He came to serve, and if we're going to follow, we have to do the same. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. May we answer that question today. 
In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would hear the cry of our heart. Maybe we're like Bartimaeus, sitting by the road, not able to grasp all that's going on. But we've heard you're here. And the need in our heart is so great that we cry out to you. Sometimes the world says, shut up. God doesn't hear you. You don't matter to God. You're not important. Who are you? But Jesus says, come to me. Come to me. And if you were the only person who ever lived, he would say, come to me. He would come for you. And in the crowd of millions, he's saying to you, come to me. And he says to us, what do you want me to do for you? Church, this is your moment. The master has sent for you. And he's asked you what he can do for you. Be brave. Be courageous. Have faith to ask for the seemingly impossible. For this is Jesus. And he can do it. Then follow him. Because he knows your name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn today. <laughs> being here today and as always if there's something that stirs your imagination or your heart to say I'd like to talk about that just a little bit more I'm here for you whatever way works best a conversation in person an email whatever would work best for you text message smoke signal I don't care 
what will work best for you to hear what Jesus says? What do you want me to do for you? Let me pray God's blessing upon you as we go our separate ways. This is a question with which we will wrestle in the moments ahead. May it not quickly fade over lunch or a football game or thoughts about what we will do next week. May it be a question that lingers in our minds and our hearts in the hours and days and weeks to come. What do you want me to do for you? Our Lord sends us into a world that needs to answer that question. And you and I have the answer in Jesus. So go and be the church and point the way to him in all things. And know that you do not go alone. Go in the love of God the Father, in the grace that comes from Christ the Son, and in the power and love of his Spirit. Go and be the church. Amen. Amen. Thank you.